This Is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Next month, Susan Laurie Park's father comes home from the wars, comes to Yale Repertory Theater. The trilogy described as a new American odyssey was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama and was awarded the 2015 Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama inspired by American history, as well as a 2014 Horton Foote Prize. Coming up, we'll speak with Amy Boratko, literary manager at Yale Repertory Theater, about the play and learn how it's part of an initiative to expose young people to the arts. First, do you know Constance Baker Motley's story? The New Haven native and child of immigrants was the first black woman to become a federal judge. Before that, she was a civil rights attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She won many desegregation cases in federal court, including suits against the University of Mississippi and the University of Georgia. And she successfully argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. She was also the first black woman to be elected to the New York State Senate. Judge Motley has a distinguished career. So why isn't she a household name? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. My first guest has written a book about Motley. Dr. Gary Ford Jr. is assistant professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College and author of Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us, when did you first hear about Constance Baker Motley? Um, I first heard about Constance Baker Motley when I was a little tyke um, growing up in New Canaan, Connecticut. I um, grew up in a family of lawyers. Uh, my mother's a lawyer. My father's a lawyer. My older sister's a lawyer. My older sister's husband is a lawyer. It was kind of the thing. And growing up in New Canaan in the early 80s, um, there actually weren't that many black attorneys, um, actually in all of Connecticut. So um, it was a small circle. Um, through that small circle, I met Connie Royster, who is uh, Judge Motley's niece, and she in turn introduced me to Judge Motley. What about Judge Motley struck you when you met her? Um, just uh, her, her presence, her grace. Um, you could tell that this was a woman who was very wise, um, and had a lot to offer, even though uh, she was not, um, you know, um, she was not very boisterous. She's usually pretty reserved. But uh, if you sit there and just listen to her for a while, you can hear history. She passed away in 2005 uh, after you met her. And again, you knew about her story through your family uh, connections. Uh, what made you then write a book about her later on? Well, I, it's a couple reasons. First of all, um, uh, when I was um, at Harvard, I was studying African American studies, and uh, I was focusing on the civil rights movement because that was my interest. And I was reading about um, all of these cases, these desegregation cases that really uh, were crucial for the movement. And I remember hearing her talking about these cases as a child, and I was like, "Well, we have James Meredith, we have Charlene Hunter Gall, we have Hamilton Holmes." Uh, but there's no mention of the woman who actually represented them and actually uh, won those cases and gained them entry to those universities. Um, so I, that struck me as a bit odd. Um, and I began to learn that uh, the the African-American history that I was learning uh, was incomplete. Um, you know, we have this traditional narrative of the civil rights movement that tends to focus uh, mostly on black men, uh, usually in the clergy. And it does not have enough space for other alternative leaders um, who did uh, crucial things for the movement, but um, because they're not in that traditional leadership role, they are kind of overlooked. Uh, women like Constance Baker Motley, who were overlooked. Again, I'm speaking with Dr. Gary Ford Jr., who's written a book about this Connecticut native. Uh, she was uh, raised in New Haven. Uh, the book is Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. We're going to learn more about her contributions to the civil rights movement and how she uh, became uh, later on uh, uh, one of the first black women to become a federal judge. But I was curious about her upbringing. Can we start there? Um, she was born in New Haven. Tell us about her family. Yes, her uh, family, I think, informed her worldview um, very much so. Uh, her parents were from Nevis. Uh, they were immigrants. Um, a typical immigrant story, you, you move to the United States, um, you try to work your, your way up um, and make a better life for your children. Uh, so her mother uh, was um, a stay-at-home mom and her father 
uh, was a chef. Uh, he was a cook, which was one of the few occupations that was open to black men at that time period. And he worked at uh, some of the prominent uh, Yale eating clubs, including the Skull and Bone Society. Um, if anybody seen the movie Skulls, <laughs> it's based on that. Um, but anyway, um, so she grew up in a, a large family. Uh, she's one of 12 siblings. And um, her time in New Haven, uh, she described it as fairly free of racism, except for a few incidences, um, which is not to say that New Haven was perfect at the time she grew up there, but uh, is far preferable than what was going on in the South at that time. So in New Haven, uh, she, there was a lot of West Indians that were living in the part of uh, the city that her family also lived? Yes. And how did that play a role in her upbringing and where they, the family uh, hung out, the church they belonged to? Yes. Well, uh, she went to St. Luke's Episcopal Church. Um, she um, grew up around a lot of West Indians, as you said, particularly uh, ones of, uh, who, who were under British rule. Um, so a very similar shared culture, um, you know, uh, the, this reserved nature um, uh, that's typical um, of uh, people coming from, say, Barbados or Nevis or um, uh, Jamaica. Uh, so uh, that was kind of provided a buffer for her because she had this uh, this community and the support network that was beyond her family. And I think that allowed her to kind of grow up uh, not experiencing some of the, the, the biases that other people might have been experiencing in New Haven at that time. So she was growing up in the 20s and 30s. Yes. Again, uh, New Haven was a, a diverse city of immigrants. Yes. And uh, when was her first time where she was she noticed discrimination because of the color of her skin? Uh, the first time was when she went with a group of friends. It was uh, a diverse group of friends, and they went to uh, go swim. Um, at the beach, and uh, her friends were allowed in, and yet she was denied entry to that beach, a uh, place of public accommodation because of the color of her skin. And that really struck her as the first time when she really um, felt that she was being othered, you know, uh, and, and that was a, had a profound effect on her um, later in life. When did she uh, first get a, a glimpse of the fact that you know women could be attorneys too? Because at that time there weren't very many women, if at all, practicing law. Uh, who were her role models? Yes, hardly any. Um, there were two uh, black women in particular um, who she knew of in childhood that kind of gave her uh, uh, the courage to pursue her dreams. You know, usually. Uh, if you see somebody who looks like you is doing something, then that makes it possible for you to do it. Uh, those two women were Eunice Hunton Carter and Jane Bolin, who both worked in New York. I think one was appointed by Dewey. The other was appointed by uh, LaGuardia. Um, and so she knew of these women, and so she knew it was possible for a black woman to become a lawyer. What about her family? Did they think it was possible for Constance to become a lawyer? Uh, that's an interesting, interesting question. Her her mother actually, when she told her mother she wanted to be a lawyer, her mother uh, told her that you're better off becoming a hairdresser. Um, so that's a bit of a discouragement right there. Uh, but you have to remember, at this time period, becoming a lawyer was kind of like uh, saying, I want to become, you know, an astronaut. You know, it was it was something that was not... Um, in the realm of possibility um, for, uh, you know, a black woman um, because there hadn't been hardly any of them. So uh, her mother was really trying to protect her um, from, you know, the dis disappointment of not being able to fulfill her dreams um, and, and in so doing happened to discourage her. But, of course, uh, Judge Miley being who she was, um, she wasn't going to take discouragement lying down. Mm -hmm. She wanted to go on to college, uh, but uh, was it difficult for her family to afford college at that time? And how did she get an in, so to speak? Yes. Uh, so being one of 12 children and also uh, with a single income household, uh, it was very difficult for them to afford college. And in fact, she couldn't afford college uh, just based on her family. Uh, we didn't have all the scholarships that are available now. Um, and so she took uh, jobs to Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, her national youth program, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt being another amazing woman who, uh, one of my all-time favorite first ladies. But anyway, um, so she was doing that. She was refurnishing furniture, and she was also becoming engaged in uh, in uh, politics uh, locally, um, civic engagement locally. And she spoke up at a, a, a meeting 
um, to this uh, white uh, philanthropist named Clarence Blakesley. And basically, um, he had built a community center for African Americans to use in New Haven and was Dixwell concerned. Dixwell Avenue? Yes. Dixwell Avenue? Yes. Mm-hmm. And was concerned that they weren't using it. And um, none of the black people wanted to tell him that the reason they weren't using it was because there's no black people on the board and they didn't feel like they had any representation. Um, so that's why it wasn't being used. Constance Baker Motley, being one who always would speak truth to power, actually stood up at this community meeting and said it um, over the gasps of some people in the audience because they thought that was quite rude. But uh, he found it refreshing and found her to be um, uh, very um, mature and very wise for her age. And so he uh, decided that he was going to fund her education as far as she wanted to go. Um, and that's how she got to go to college and then law school. She made... Uh she made the decision to uh, pursue a college degree down south. Yes. Why, why did she want to do it there? Uh, I think she wanted to experience uh, black culture and go to an all-black university. And at the time, those were in the south. Um, and so she got down to Fisk, and um, when she got down there, uh, riding on the Jim Crow car and uh, some of the aspects of southern life, uh, she felt was a really a, a hard adjustment. So she didn't... Uh, she didn't end up finishing at Fisk. She finished up at, at NYU. This is where we live. I'm speaking with Dr. Gary Ford, Jr., Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College, also author of Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. As we're learning today, Constance was a New Haven native, and she is one of the unsung women of the civil rights movement. Have you learned about Constance Baker, Baker Motley's story? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. Uh, now, you said that she transferred up to NYU um, and then eventually to Columbia Law School. So one of the uh, the first um, moments in her career where she was a first there, too. Yes. Um, she was um, one of the first black women at Columbia Law School. Um, her first uh, are many. Um, uh, and she um, basically, when she got to Columbia Law School, uh, she started working at the LDF. She's the first woman working there. Um, Clarence Blakesley actually at LDF hoped, Legal Defense Fund. Yes, Legal Defense Fund. NAACP Legal Defense Fund, sorry. Um, Clarence Blakesley had actually hoped uh, to set her up with a position on at a Wall Street firm after she finished law school, uh, but she informed him that uh, she was, she, she was um, uh, going to go work for the LDF instead. And she met Thurgood Marshall. Uh, tell me about what that was like for her. Um, she had great a- admiration for... Thurgood Marshall, he, um, from a very, very um, early on in their relationship, he began to give her uh, um, significant responsibility. Matter of fact, she drafted one of the complaints that it became Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so they, um, all of the members of the LDF uh, were very open in allowing her to assume responsibility and uh, actually go down south and be lead, lead counsel on, on uh, many of these cases that she argued. Why were they open to her as a woman, as a, an attorney? Because, again, she's one of the first, and during that time, a lot of women weren't in these roles. Why were they accepting of her? I think um, even though a lot of these were men of their times, they, they recognized her talent. Uh, while she was even still in law school before she had graduated, um, her work was exemplary. And um, I think the LDF um, was not so well-funded as to where they could – uh, basically squander talent uh, such as hers um, by having her perform secretarial duties or something else like that, which wouldn't really uh, maximize her talents. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're learning about Constance Baker Motley. She was a pioneer in many ways. First, as a female civil rights attorney in the 60s, she won several defining desegregation cases. She would later become the first black woman to serve as a federal judge. We're learning about her today from our guest, Dr. Gary Ford Jr., who's written a book about her life. We're going to continue to learn about um, her contributions to the civil rights movement and uh, what her legacy can teach us today. You can join the conversation, too. Six zero two seven five seven two six six. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. <music> 
This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Today we're learning about a New Haven native and child of immigrants who was the first black woman to become a federal judge. Constance Baker Motley was a civil rights attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She argued and won several key desegregation cases in federal court and before the U.S. Supreme Court. She also represented those who were jailed for participating in sit-ins, freedom rides, and marches, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now you may not know her name because as my guest, Dr. Gary Ford Jr. writes in his book, quote, much of the work that Motley and other black women performed in the civil rights movement was not fully documented. They did not receive proper recognition and credit from historians for their contributions to the movement's success. Dr. Ford is in the studio with me as we learn more about Motley's life. In his book, Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. And you can join the conversation, too, 860-275-7266. Let's talk about uh, Dr. Ford, Gary, about um, Constant Motley, Constance Baker Motley's uh, contribution to that historic desegregation case, Brown versus Board. Tell us about her role in that. Yes, yeah, so Brown versus Board was uh, towards the early end of her career at the LDF. Uh, but she was uh, one of the attorneys who was working on that case and actually drafted one of the complaints that was merged into Brown versus Board of Education. Because there, there was a few different cases that were merged into one for Brown 1 and then Brown 2. Now, uh, when she did that work, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, Thurgood Marshall, the team, felt comfortable sending her down south uh, to do a lot of the grassroots work and to meet and talk to the people. What was that like for her as a black woman? as an attorney, and how did the segregationist react to her? Well, I think um, uh, there's this notion that uh, black women being down south would be in less danger than a black man, even though uh, the history doesn't really back that up. Um, I think Thurgood Marshall and some of the other uh, uh, male attorneys at the LDF had made the argument, as a matter of fact, she says this in her autobiography, that that she would have a better time in these southern courts because all white men had black mammies, I think was the quote. Uh, you know, a mammy being um, a slave woman uh, who would take care of the master's family, cook and take care of the kids, uh, and was not seen as very threatening. Um, in reality, um, uh, regardless of gender, if you went down south, um, even regardless of race in many cases, if you went down south and you were agitating and disrupting the way of life, the segregationist way of life, your your life was in danger. Uh, we, we have countless examples of uh, black men, black women, white men, white women um, being uh, um, uh, assaulted or killed uh, down south trying to uh, do the work of integration. So who kept her safe? Um, when she was down south, um, uh, in Mississippi, in Georgia, in Alabama, uh, working all these school desegregation cases, uh, there were local members of the NAACP who would um, act as bodyguards because they couldn't count on the police to provide protection for her. Um, or the some local. of those police were members of the Klan? Yes, some of them were moonlighting in white bedsheets. Um, that's just fact. Um, and the local FBI was also had some, um, sometimes they were had their biases as well. Um, so it was um, mostly private security. The NAACP, but also sympathetic whites um, who were working with the NAACP and wanted to see segregation end in their communities. Let's talk about um, some other significant cases, important desegregation cases that uh, Constance Baker Motley worked on. You mentioned James Meredith versus the University of Mississippi. Yes. Talk, tell us about that, that effort to uh, desegregate and allow James Meredith, a black man, to go to that university. Yes. So um, there's levels to discrimination. Um, at this time, Mississippi was um, uh, by and far had the strictest form of segregation and um, white supremacy in the South. Um, so getting James Meredith into University of Mississippi was a monumental task. Uh, she actually described it as the last battle of the Civil War uh, because of the troops and the violence. Uh, when she's finally able to get him admitted to uh, University of Mississippi, um, there's a riot on campus. Uh, a few people were killed. Um, so it was, um, it was a, a, a sea change for that state. It was a dynamic shift, and people weren't ready, and they responded with violence. Uh, even though uh, she won that case and James Meredith was able to become a student, what was the reality for him? Um, 
Well, James Meredith is a an interesting person. Uh, you have to be uh, you have to be a little fearless and and maybe also a little bit um, you know of a dreamer in order to um, subject yourself to the treatment that he was subjected to on campus. Uh, he was ost- ostracized completely. Um, no students would talk to him. Um, his housing situation was um, uh, in flux often. Matter of fact, there's only one person who talked to him while he was there, and that was a white professor on campus who actually would have lunch with him uh, and would interact with him in that way. And that professor actually later on ended up killing himself. Um, you know, it, it's not clear how much of that had to do with harassment associated with being, uh, you know, an N-word lover or whatever. Um, um, but I'm sure that had something to do with it. She also worked uh, with uh, the community in Birmingham uh, when, during the Children's Crusades and when all of these children, uh, these thousands of students, uh, black students, who were trained in nonviolent uh, demonstrations to uh, desegregate the city of Birmingham. Um, talk, t- uh, talk us through her role there and how uh, she worked with uh, more well-known figures in the civil rights movement, including Dr. King. Yes. So... She represented Dr. King personally a few times, uh, got him out of jail a few times. In the Birmingham schools case, um, she was really critical to his ascension as a leader of the civil rights movement because in that, uh, in that schools case, they had planned a march on Sunday. And um, somebody else who actually his name uh, escapes my mind right now had convinced Dr. King to include children in that march. And so they included the children and then, of course, uh, the police responded with uh, hoses and dogs, and um, the children were um, were harassed in that way, and then all, also arrested en masse. Thousands of kids arrested. Um, and while they were in jail, they were also expelled from schools. And the parents weren't going to stand for that. I mean, it's one thing for them to um, go through the trials and tribulations of trying to integrate, but to have their children suffer in that manner and maybe not ever graduate uh, was too much for them. Um, so she was sent down south to get them out of jail and then also get them back in school um, There's an in, uh, to get an injunction to, injunction to prevent their expulsion. And she was able to do that, and because she was able to do that, it restored the faith of the parents in the movement, and they continued to support Dr. King, whereas otherwise they might not have. Well, we talked about the fact that um, as Constance Baker Motley had to argue in a lot of uh, hostile courts. Yes. Uh, what was that like for her? I read in your book that sometimes these judges would turn their back as she argued a case before them. Yes. Um, sometimes they refer to her as the Motley woman as opposed to um, Attorney Motley. Uh, sometimes they would actually turn and face the wall when she was giving arguments um, uh, just because they could not accept um, a black person and a black woman basically um, arguing case before them. Um, it shook their whole worldview. Uh, many of them uh, grew up uh, with black people only in subservient roles. Um, so uh, dealing that with that also outside of the courtroom, uh, the little indignities like having to go to the other side of town to get lunch um, or uh, people harassing you on the street, um, sometimes people not wanting to interact with you, even local counsel. Sometimes it's hard to get a local co-counsel because uh, they had to live in those communities, and they didn't want to upset the apple cart. Um, so uh, all of that um, was was uh, rolled in there, uh, as well as some judges who um, wouldn't even um, call her case to be to be uh, argued because uh, they knew they were going to lose, so they were just dragging their feet. So uh, her case would be on the docket for you know months and in one case years uh, before it'd be called. She went on to represent Dr. King in other struggles. How did he view her? Uh, he was a, a great um, a great admirer of Constance Baker Motley. As a matter of fact, later on, when um, when she was up for a federal judgeship, um, he was one. Of, Dr. King was one of the people that LBJ called uh, to get uh, a sense of of who Constance Baker Motley was. Uh, so he he felt that he owed her a debt not only for that Birmingham schools case, but also for getting him out of jail uh, a few times, uh, America's Georgia and a couple other places.
This is where we live. Uh, Dr. Gary Ford Jr. is in studio with me, Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College, author of the book Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. Uh, judge Motley, she'd become a federal judge uh, later on in life. Uh, she was a New Haven native, a child of immigrants, and one of the unsung heroines of the civil rights movement. Uh, her career spanned more than 20 years, uh, helping the civil rights movement uh, with uh, many of these uh, cases, uh, in court, uh, oftentimes hostile courts. Uh, when was the breaking point for her where uh, she uh, moved on with her career and couldn't do this work anymore in the South? Um, okay. Uh, the, that's a complicated issue. Um, basically, uh, at the LDF, she'd been at the LDF for a while uh, and had won all of these segregation cases. Uh, but when the time came to pick a replacement for Thurgood Marshall, who was going uh, to the bench, um, they actually selected Jack Greenberg, um, who was a fantastic lawyer and, um, you know, has done a lot for civil rights. Um, however, uh, Judge Motley had actually been there longer than him, and her record was uh, equally distinguished, if not more so. Um, I can't think of somebody who had argued and won more civil rights cases, especially school segregation cases, than her. Um, on the one hand, um, I think... Thurgood Marshall and Bob Carter uh, were having a bit of a feud at this time because Thurgood Marshall was focusing most of his efforts on fundraising, uh, which is great. I mean, without money, you can't, you can't, uh, you don't have the resources mm-hmm. to argue these cases. Um, but Bob Carter felt like the most of the the, the legal work was falling on his shoulders, um, so he wanted Thurgood Marshall to focus more on that. Um, and so they had a rift, and Thurgood Marshall wanted to put somebody in who was more in line with his philosophy, and that was Jack Greenberg. So he moved very quickly to install Jack Greenberg as his successor, uh, whereas Bob Carter was supporting Constance Baker Motley. Um, and so was um, uh, Medgar Evers, uh, who was her biggest, her biggest cheerleader uh, for that position and was very upset when she didn't get it. Um, so there was a politics involved. I think also we have to look at these. These are men of their time, even though... They gave her vast amounts of responsibility and really nurtured her to be a civil rights lawyer. I think they might have also been uncomfortable at that time with having a woman in the top chair. Um, And, uh, you know, so I think gender also played a role in her being passed over. We should mention uh, before she uh, headed back uh, north uh, in her career as an attorney and later a judge, she successfully argued up to 10 cases for the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, she argued 10 cases, won nine of them. Um, the 10th case, which was about the right of prosecutors to exclude blacks from juries on the basis of race, uh, you know, because they have their challenges. They can get rid of uh, jurors for any reason. It's called presumptive challenge. Um, and at the time, the Supreme Court sided uh, with the the prosecutors and said that they could uh, exclude people on the basis of race. But 20 years later, they actually changed their mind and came around to her point of view. So really, she was 10 for 10. It's just one of those uh, victories was delayed by two decades. You mentioned Medgar Evers. Uh, he was assassinated. How did that impact uh, her, including, again, because she was working in very dangerous circumstances. There were times that in your book, uh, you write that she couldn't fall asleep because she was worried about who would come to the house uh, yes. uh, to hurt her because of her work in the, in the courts against the segregationists. Yes. Uh, in certain places, um, she... Um, felt so much uh, the fear of violence that she couldn't sleep. Um, and Megra Evers, of course, was one of those places in Mississippi. Uh, he got shot right in front of the house where she slept and where she actually brought her son uh, to Mississippi, and they stayed at the Megra Evers' house together. Um, so his assassination and also uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination really uh, affected her personally. And I think about that time she was... Um, she started to reevaluate um, all of the trips she was taking down south um, because uh, she was very close with both of them. Matter of fact, she was on stage when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech. I'm glad that you mentioned her family, uh, Gary, because, again, she lived up north, but she traveled so often and worked in the South. Um, tell us about what that strain must have been like and the fact that she had a supportive husband um, who 
who you know she, he was able to to take care of the son or have others take care of the son while she's doing this work? Yeah, I mean it was a great strain on her to be away from her family, uh, and I, I'm sure her family missed her. Uh, her son has said that he missed her when she was gone, uh, but their fight, family dynamic was so strong that they were able to get through it. Um, and this is time to really talk about her husband, uh, Joel Motley uh, the second, who um, was uh, uh, he he was also an attorney. He went to NYU Law and he was in real estate in New York, um, and he was a very powerful man. Um, however, he also really admired her and respected the work that she was doing, and so he decided to take on a lot of the traditional roles that are assigned to the woman in a relationship in order to facilitate her going down south. So a lot of the child care and stuff like that, he was the one who decided to do that. So in his own way, um, he was also a very radical leader. You know, people think, when they think about a radical leader of the civil rights movement, they think about somebody in a leather jacket with a fist in the sky. There's different ways to be radical. Um, Constance Baker Motley was radical in that she would not take her, um, take no for an answer as regarded race and gender. And her husband was also radical in that um, he was confident enough in himself um, to not feel belittled by taking on what was considered, quote unquote, woman's work. Uh, she would leave the Legal Defense Fund, uh, eventually becoming the first black woman to serve in the New York State Senate. And then she got a call from the White House. What happened? Yes. So while she's in the New York State Senate, um, she became aligned with uh, Bobby Kennedy. Um, and... Um, Bobby Kenny was actually the one who initially put her name in for uh, a, a judgeship. However, uh, they had a falling out uh, when she supported a candidate which he did not support. And I guess he felt that she was going to basically rubber stamp <laughs> whatever he wanted uh, because uh, he was a Kennedy. Uh, but we know from a very early age that Motley is going to speak her truth no matter what. So um, uh, after that... She, uh, it seemed as if Kennedy was sitting on her nomination. Um, and that's when uh, LBJ heard about her. And at this time, uh, LBJ and Bobby Kennedy were frenemies. You know, uh, they um, uh, there was a rivalry there. So LBJ uh, took it upon himself to nominate her to the federal bench. And then after he did so, um, he called Bobby Kennedy and asked uh, if he wanted to be the first one to congratulate her. At the time, uh, there were some who opposed her nomination because of sexism? Yes. Uh, so early on in her career, I think race was uh, uh, much more of a factor when she was going down south. I mean, gender was still an issue. Uh, but later on, um, in New York, when she was um, being appointed to the bench, it became more about her gender. Uh, so originally, LBJ wanted to nominate her to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, they're the ones who hear all the big Wall Street cases. It's very, um, it's a very uh, a prestigious appointment, and the the white men who were there did not want a woman um, on that court. So they were against that, and they had to compromise by uh, nominating her to the Southern District uh, Court in New York. Um, however, there's also was some issues that she had to face there with regard to sexism. Uh, she also, in her career, would later uh, write her own autobiography. Yes. Um, it was interesting. I think it was either in your book or that you wrote that at, when she died in 2005, uh, the obituary had listed all of her contributions in her long career. But before that, there wasn't much written about her other than autobiography. Yes. Um, so, yeah, there, there's her autobiography. There's my book. And that's pretty much it. Um you know, as, as I said before, uh, my goal is to try to rewrite um, some of these non-traditional leaders into the historical narrative of the civil rights movement. Um, you know, just to so our our, our children uh, can have a more complete view of of Black history and also this is American history. Um, so people like a Constance Baker Motley or somebody like a Joanne Robinson, who actually is the one who actually led the Montgomery bus boycott, and you know, everybody associated, associates that with Martin Luther King Jr., where she's the one who actually started it, distributed the, the leaflets and uh, arranged carpools for months before Dr. King got there. She was someone who accomplished many firsts, but during that time, she never considered herself a feminist. Why? I think... Uh, it's an interesting question. I ask myself this question sometimes. I think it might have to do with the fact that first wave feminism 
uh, which was what was going on at the time, uh, wasn't really that concerned with race. Uh, and so, so maybe she felt that that didn't really speak for her, and that's why she didn't consider herself a feminist. I mean, when you look at her career um, and you look at uh, just the way she lived her life, I think it's quite clear that she was a feminist. You know, a feminist is basically somebody who just uh, thinks that uh, men and women should be uh, treated equally in society. So if you look at that definition, she definitely was a feminist, but she did not consider herself to be a feminist. We have we got a message from a woman by the name of Constance Royster, who you know, a niece and namesake of Constance Baker Motley. She writes, the family is delighted that your book and your presentations, especially to young people, are giving light to the work and life of her aunt and her place in history. As you go around to schools and you mention this monumental woman uh, to uh, young people, what is the reaction to her story? The reaction is usually um, surprise. Um, both from students, but also uh, from educators um, who are unfamiliar with her work. Um, it depends on where I go. Um, a few weeks ago, I was actually at, in New Haven schools um, at Hill House, at actually the school she graduated from in New Haven. And there, uh, a larger percentage of the students knew who she was. But um, again, at her school, uh, where she she went to school, there's no real monument to her or anything. Uh, I think there's a, you know, a picture of her in the library, but you know, we have to we have to do more to kind of get her name out there and get her the recognition she deserves. Um all the people she represented have the Congressional Gold Medal pretty much and yet she does not. And actually I've been working with Senator Richard Blumenthal to try to get her that recognition. Uh, we've been learning about why Constance Baker Motley is not a household name, despite all of her contributions. Again, I'm speaking with Dr. Gary Ford, Jr., who's written a book about this New Haven native. Uh, because you've done so much research and you understand a lot about her life and what drove her to do the things that she did, when you we look at America today, what do you think would be Judge Motley's uh, opinion of some of the movements happening today, whether it's Black Lives Matter or what's going on in politics today? Well, I think she probably would be disappointed with the the um, tribalism going on in politics right now, uh, the divisiveness. Um, you know, I think uh, she was a great believer in people seeing the common, uh, the things we have in common as opposed to our differences. Uh, so, um, you know, in the age now where we're having to deal with uh, people who uh, love to be in echo chambers and love to uh, focus on uh, what other people have uh, and taking that away because they think they'll benefit more from that, uh, I think she would be disappointed in that. She would, however, I think, be very encouraged by uh, some of these movements that are going on. You have Black Lives Matter movement, which is uh, a civil rights organization that's actually created and run by mostly women. I think she would find that to be very um, compelling. Uh, you also have uh, the Never Again uh, movement going on nationwide now. It started in Florida. Uh, that is also uh, has, uh, I'm not going to say women, but girls actually up front and, and leading and speaking their truth. Um, so I think she would be very encouraged about that. Um, and I think she would also be encouraged with what seems like a wave of, of, um, of uh, new, new politicians who are coming uh, to challenge uh, the politics as usual going on right now. And I think she would be hopeful about 2018 uh, with regard to that. I want to thank Dr. Gary Ford, Jr., Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College, author of the book Constance Baker Motley, One Woman's Fight for Civil Rights and Equal Justice Under Law. Again, she was a New Haven native, a daughter of immigrants, accomplished so much, um, became a first in many facets. I should mention um, that she also was the first woman to serve as the Chief Justice of the District Court for the Southern District of New York, and she assumed that senior status until her death in 2005. Thank you, Gary so much for coming in and telling us about Constance Baker Motley. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Uh, coming up next, we're going to hear from the Yale Repertory Theater that will stage Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three next month. We're going to talk about that award-winning play and how Yale Repertory Theater is reaching out to young people through an initiative called Willpower.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. On Thursday, we're live from New Haven from Connecticut Public Radio's new studio at Gateway Community College. I'm going to sit down with New Haven Police Chief Anthony Campbell. We're going to talk a a lot about uh, policing efforts as well as some national issues, and we want to hear from you, too. That's on Thursday. Now, speaking of New Haven, next month, Susan Laurie Park's father comes home from the wars, parts one, two, and three. It's coming to Yale Repertory Theater. The trilogy described as a new American odyssey was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for drama. And I want to welcome to our conversation now Amy Boratko, literary manager at Yale Repertory Theater. Amy, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Now, we just have a few minutes, but let's talk about this this amazing play from acclaimed playwright Susan Laurie Parks. Why the decision to bring Father Comes Home from the Wars here to Connecticut? Uh, Susan Laurie Parks has had a long history with our theater. So in the 90s, some of her earliest works, such as the America play, uh, were directed here uh, with her collaborator, Liz Diamond, who is our resident director, and she's the chair of the directing program at the Yale School of Drama. So we've had a long history with Susan Laurie Parks and launching her works. And uh, it's been on our radar since she premiered this play at the public in 2014 uh, to see if we can continue the life of the play and uh, pair her work again with Liz Diamond and give it a new production uh, here for our New Haven audiences, some of whom might remember seeing those early works of Susan Laurie Parks. And she's undeniably one of the most important voices in the American theater and will long go down in the canon. So it's a uh, also a great opportunity to give our audiences and the students that we'll talk about a chance to see what will become an American classic. Uh, We mentioned that this was a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Walk us through uh, the production of Father Comes Home from the Wars. I understand it takes place during the Civil War. Yes. So it uh, opens in 1862 in far west Texas, or as Susan Laurie Parks described, nowhere. And it takes place, so that's really a liminal space in the middle of the American Civil War, a place being in Texas that is still in the middle of being torn between being its own country, um, being a part of Mexico, and being a part of the United States, and remote from where much of the action of the Civil War that we normally associate is going on. And the play opens in this place uh, upon a man named Hero. And Hero is a slave who has been offered the promise of his freedom if he goes to fight for the Confederacy with his master. And so he must grapple with that decision about whether to go or stay, um, what it means for his partner, Penny, um, and what the odyssey he will go on, both going to war and coming back. And this play is a loose interpretation of Homer's The Odyssey. Uh, Yes. So that's uh, Homer's Odyssey is one of the many ingredients that Susan Laurie Parks uh, weaves through and glances and alludes to in her work. And there's characters like the Odyssey dog and Penny, who references Penelope, and this story of a hero who has uh, gone to war and come back. So she's really drawing on this these fundamental um, hero's journeys tales that we find in all of Western literature, and she goes back to the heart of it. But she also, you find Homer, Euripides, Shakespeare, Beckett, um, allusions to Rogers and Hammerstein. So she's really weaving um, so many both uh, inherent but like glancing blows at the classical uh, history, theatrical and literary that we're all familiar with. What about this play It will appeal to the traditional theater goer? I think the traditional theater goer will really latch on to the story of Hero, who I think that we will see whether or not he's a hero or he's really an anti-hero. So he's a slave that must really reckon with what is the price of freedom and what does it mean to be free and how does one achieve it? And is that even possible in America, both during the Civil War for a slave, for somebody who is African-American? And is that even possible now, a full sense of um, freedom and participation in society? And what legacies do we have now? So I think that there's this epic story that anybody is going to be pulled into. Susan Laurie Parks has 
uh, such a keen sense of dialogue and character building while twisting our expectations. So there's going to be the surprises that you love to see when you go on a theatrical journey and just great storytelling with a sense of humor, um, with a sense of compassion, and also with important questions. And the people who like classics, there's enough of the inspiration of Homer and the greats and these benchmarks of Western literature that anybody who wants to see that or is used to seeing Shakespeare in this particular slot of our Yale rep season, I think that they're going to be satisfied on the level that you're satisfied with a large scale Shakespeare production. Amy Boratko is literary manager at Yale Repertory Theater. Uh, we're talking about uh, the production of Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three, and uh, why uh, it's going to be staged at Yale Repertory Theater. Uh, again, you mentioned uh, the connection with Susan Laurie Parks uh, uh, to Yale, and how are you using this production to engage young people in the New Haven area? Uh, well, we have a program. It's now in its 15th year called Willpower. And when the program was started uh, under the leadership of our artistic director, James Bundy, as, as the name connotes, um, it was to bring students in New Haven and Connecticut to see productions of Shakespeare plays. But since then, and since we, al- we don't always uh, produce a Shakespeare play every year, we've become more expansive of finding the plays in our season that will speak to what's being taught in our local school communities and that will speak to a young person seeing theater. So over the past 15 years, 24,000 students have come through our doors to see early morning matinees. And we have decided this season and last season to do uh, more than one uh, production that has this offering. So earlier this season, uh, uh, several hundred students, uh, I think close to a thousand saw Uh, two morning matinees of our production of Native Son, which was an adaptation by Nambi E. Kelly. And now uh, over a thousand uh, local high school students will come and see Susan Laurie Park. So we think that because this play grapples with American history, because it grapples with the hero's journey that so many of these ninth and 10th graders study in their curriculum, that there's an expansive view for them to I get to experience theater, but there's so many connections to what they're learning and getting to see the theater on stage. And the Willpower program is really a comprehensive program that includes study guides. It includes free workshops for the educators so that they understand our production and the theater going experience here so they can help enrich the experience for their students. And it also includes things like this year and last year we've been doing a technical theater tour for a select group of high schoolers. And it started out last year with students from that were already interested in technical theater. And this year we've incorporated students from technical schools. So there are students from Kanor Technical School who came and they saw the production of Native Son. And then they went through and saw our shops and they saw how their skills um, in technical fields could be applied to the arts. And that's something that we're continuing here and we'll do for Father Comes Home from the Wars for a select group of students. And so it's really a chance for these students to really see not only art, but how the skills they're learning in their classroom can be applied to an artistic career. Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three will be performed at the Yale Repertory Theater from March 16th to April 7th, again from acclaimed playwright uh, Susan Laurie Parks. This is her uh, play that will be staged again next month. We're going to have more information on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Amy Boratko is literary manager at Yale Repertory Theater. Thanks so much for speaking with us today, Amy. Oh, thank you so much. Today's show produced by senior producer Lydia Brown. A special thanks to our technical producer, Kayon Wolf, and to our WNPR interns, uh, Garnet. Thank you so much for your help today screening calls. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.